Um, so first, I'd like to uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, it's 6.02, uh, and I would like to call the meeting of HCDC to order. Our second agenda item is consideration of the meeting minutes from June 23rd of 2022. Are there any edits or corrections to the June minutes? May I have a motion to approve the June 23rd of 2022 HCDC minutes? So moved. Do you want to try this one? We could share. I guess he needs it more than I do. That's okay. That's okay. Well, it's okay. They got mask on, then they can't move. It's okay. And so I heard the motion. May I have a second? I second. And all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Um, agenda item. Uh, number three is public comment of items not on the agenda. Are there any public comments for items not on the agenda? Okay, uh, moving on to agenda item number four, uh, we'd like to welcome our new members. Uh, we have a new member joining us today, um, Jennifer Halet. Jennifer, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Jen Halet. I'm happy to be here. Um, I've lived in Iowa City for this is my eighth year here, and I call it home. I've moved around a lot when I was younger, and I've lived here actually longer now than anywhere else. Um, I work at the university. I am an associate professor of instruction in the Department of Social and Crim, and um, I yeah, I'm just excited to be here and get involved in, in local politics. When I was in graduate school, I did do some work at a community development financial institute in Sacramento, California. And based on that experience, and then just also some of the teaching material that I use, I have come to think that you know housing is just uh, so incredibly important for so many reasons in people's lives. So I'm excited to be a part of this. Thanks. Thank you. And then maybe to um, help introduce ourselves as well, um, would you guys care to give a brief introduction uh, to Jennifer and yourself? So I guess I can start. I'm Caleb Bining. Um, I work in real estate and affordable housing and uh, landscape construction. I'm Elizabeth Merlecat. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a mobile crisis responder and supervisor with Community Crisis Services. Um, and interested in kind of the intersection between mental health and housing security, yeah. I'm Marianne Dennis and I'm actually, I'm retired, um, although I have just taken a part-time job, but I retired from um, being the executive director of the Housing Fellowship for 27 years. And the Housing Fellowship is a uh, nonprofit housing developer and, pro and property manager. I'm Becky Reedus, and I'm retired also. Well, tell them about what you do. <laughs> I'm Nasr Mohammed, I'm quality assurance engineer. I'm Erica Kubli, I'm on staff, I'm the neighborhood services coordinator. Brianna Tool, also in the city, I'm a planner in the city. And now for agenda item number five officer nominations. Uh, would we like to make officer nominations tonight or prefer to defer them uh, to a later meeting? I, I have a question, Caleb. Are you, would you be willing to consider the position of chair? Yes. My preference then is to do it tonight. Yeah, that makes sense. Are there any nominations for vice chair? Are you going to be at most of the meetings, Caleb? <laughs> I hope so, yes. Okay, I would be willing to do that. Then may I? 
May I have a motion to uh, nominate Ms. Dennis as Vice Chair of HCDC? So moved. And may I have a second? Seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> any opposed? Motion carried. Are there any nominations for chair? I nominate you, Caleb. Second. And could I have a motion for that? Aye. So moved. And second? Seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, on to agenda item number six. Item number six is a discussion of the home ARP allocation plan and consideration of budget recommendation to council. Would staff like to introduce the plan and recommendations? Sure, so can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so um, the city received about almost $1.8 million in home ARP funds through the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, this isn't the ARPA funds that the city received. This is a separate pool of money that we've got because we're home funding recipients. Um, but it did come out of the same act, um, federal act. So eligible activities, um, development and support of affordable housing, tenant-based rent assistance, um, provision of supportive services, and acquisition and development of non-congregate shelter units. That's what we can use this funding for. Um, but when we do um, home projects, you'll see um, that we're typically, like if we do a rental project, we're typically serving someone under 60% so we're looking at income as the qualifying factor that makes them eligible for the program. However, these funds, they, they have a phrase called qualifying population, so it's not, not technically based on income, but the eligibility is people experiencing homelessness, at risk of homelessness, fleeing domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking or human trafficking, and then other populations with high risk of housing instability. So it's, it's some, some of the home rules are the same and some of them are very different. So um, we developed an allocation plan and that's what we have to submit to HUD in order to get our funds. And so a portion of the money is gonna be for admin for the LB city staff who's administering the programs. And then the rest of it we put out, um, we um, did an application process for people to apply for those funds. And we ended up getting four applications um, Shelter House has a supportive services for permanent, permanent support housing, Iowa Legal Aid, um, legal services to increase housing stability, um, domestic violence intervention program is putting towards the construction of their shelter that they're building, and then um, UAY, United Action for Youth, applied for their transitional living program extension. Um, so, Staff scored the applications and made a funding recommendation, which is within the allocation plan. So we're looking for a recommendation of the plan as a whole, but also if you have um, edits to the allocation, we're, we're open to hearing about that as well. Um, our process um, for this plan, um, we had to do some consultation with agencies that serve the, the qualifying populations. So you'll see all of the agencies that we consulted with in the plan. Started at the local homeless coordinating board and talked to all those agencies and then had um, some consultations with various agencies outside of that. Um, we also completed a needs assessment and gap analysis and so we identified what gaps there are in our services and, and then kind of related the projects that applied towards how we can fill those gaps. So that was our process. Um, I included the, the scoring criteria that staff used and how we got those scores and how we allocated it. Um, Cassie Grip is administering these funds and she did a memo of how kind of our thought process as we are allocating the projects. Um, and our next step would be to take this to the for recommendation from the commission and then we would take this to city council for approval and then we would submit it to HUD and with their approval we could start our projects. Do we have any recommendations or questions? I have, actually have a question. So is the budget that um, we received, uh, is that set in stone or because um, the amount that was budgeted for non-congregate shelter 
was 500,000. But in the plan, within the plan, isn't that in the plan? Um, I'm on page eight, home art activities. Yes. But DBIP applied for 750,000. <clears> so is, is that okay or? We, so our recommendation was 500,000 for that project based on the scores. No, I know, but. Okay. <clears throat> Was it, could they apply for 750,000 when there's only 500,000 in that? Oh, when we, when we solicited the applications, we didn't have the money into different okay. sectors. All right. mm -hmm. uh, we did that after we did the application. Okay. Um, but I did forget to mention one thing is that we have um, about 300,000 in reserves. And the reason we did that is because the state has home art money and they, they're um, telling us that if local, like if Iowa City organizations want to apply for state funding, they need to have a local match. So we set aside money okay. so that um, we could leverage that state funding down the road. And the state's not ready to do their process yet. So right. um, we're thinking that an agency might apply for state money and need a local, a local um, allocation. So that's our plan with that money. That was the question. Only question I had was whether that was the reason for giving those to agencies with lower scores a percentage of their request or is that kind of like a standard way of operating that you would get you would sort of be like well because they were the third they get this percentage rather than the total um, I think if, if we had the funds to use then we typically and projects were eligible we'd probably fully fund them okay but we also wanted to make sure that we had um, a sufficient pot to match the state money because we know yes. that's going to be a lot more than what we have and so we think that's a, a good use of our funds. Yeah, absolutely. I read that in there. That's thoughtful. And theoretically, the applicants here could apply for state funds, correct? Right. Okay. If, if it was a separate project that we didn't already fund locally, they wouldn't be eligible unless we gave them local home art money. So uh, both the DBIP and the Shelter House are these projects that we funded just uh, a couple months ago, it's the same project. Yes, I believe so. So the shelter construction we've given, we gave them four hundred twenty-five thousand in CDBG money. It's for the same project, and then um, shelter house. I believe this is for the five hundred one project for operational okay. expenses. So, with United Action for Youth, I'm a little troubled by them. Number one, they're the lowest. Um, and they're only getting half their recommendation, so $30,000. And I understand that they scored low because um, they didn't specifically identify homeless youth as a subpopulation with the greatest need. Did you reach out to them at all? Was that a mistake? Or is it that um, homeless youth are not um, I, uh, going to be the population served. I guess I want some clarification on that. Are you asking that? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, so they, they are. They would be serving homeless youth or at risk of being homeless youth. But when we did our consultation, that wasn't one of the strongest um, needs that we identified. And you know, there, there could be. Um, Laws in our in our consultation process, of course, but um, we have to we have to be able to justify it in the plan as well. So that's that's the route we took. Why is those application or only graded by by the staff and not by the commissioners? Um, so this is kind of a a funding funding that we don't typically get and it's we just it was more of a timing issue <laughs> um, that was part of it and it, it's a complicated program and if the, the commission was felt strongly about wanting to score them we could we could defer this and um, do that process if you guys were interested in doing that so according so I, I understand that there are things that I probably don't under, understand about this but uh, would it be a problem if we if we wanted to move United Action for Youth up to say forty five thousand dollars 
take 15,000 from some other, one of the other large pots? Um, we, we could do that. I, I don't have their application in front of me. Um, I know that they were, um, we, we cut it in half because I think they were doing two different properties and that we would be able to serve one, but I, I'm sure that they could work with the additional funds and maybe serve an additional um, household with that. So that would be an option if the, if the commission recommended that. Can we get more money from the reservance? We have $3,316 on the reservance. Yeah, we could, we could take it from the reserve and still have about three hundred. Do you have other sort of agencies reach out after this application process to suggest that they might want to pursue that second that reserve pool or just sort of in case so that they're not disqualified from the state does that question make sense yeah um, yeah we had a couple agencies reach out about it okay some that were and some that were not grants. okay so if, if we ended up not getting any requests for a local match with state funds, we could just do another funding round. Mm. Um, so DBIP has to raise a lot of money to do this project. And so what happens if, um, or what's the timeline to commit the funds and then to have them expended for the, for the ARP funding? until September 2030 to spend these funds. So we okay. have quite a bit of time. Okay. All right. able to, we, our plan is to try to keep within the home um, statutory requirements, which is a <coughs> 24 month commitment for your expenditure. <coughs> Ideally, we'd be able to do that, but it's not, um, those requirements aren't tied to this. Okay. Okay. I'm actually pretty comfortable with um, the staff recommendation if, and if you want to add, Fifteen thousand at UAY. That I'm I'm fine with that also. I do, and I can I can make that motion if you want. Uh, I have one more. So, with UAY, UAY's um, I, what, teen mom transitional housing. Mm -hmm. They do the transitional housing for teen mothers, right? It's not just it's not just parents in this the TLP I think is not specifically for for parent young parents that's a separate well, program okay but that's not my question oh I see so aren't those the residents of those homes aren't they considered homeless because it's really transitional housing yeah they would be homeless or at risk of homelessness yeah so Yeah. So it would definitely be eligible for the home art funds, but we are trying to tie it to our needs assessment and um, what what we heard that was the greatest need at the okay. community. And, and there's there's HUD data that goes along with that. So, um, but they would definitely be eligible. So you made that motion, right, Becky? Mm -hmm. uh, I will. Um, uh, first of all, I, I move that we uh, increase the UAY funding from recommended 30 to 45,000. And take it from where? I guess that's up for sta up to staff to do. Oh, I mean, if we want to take it from another funder, then uh, I, I mean, we could split it between DVIP and Shelter House if we wanted to do 7,500 from both of those. Um, otherwise, if you think it's okay to take it from the reserves, then we will just have reserves of three hundred and one thousand dollars. So I recommend reserves. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Uh, agenda item number seven, review and consideration. May I have a motion for the approval of the allocation plan? So moved. 
second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, agenda item number seven, a review and consideration, consider approval of FY24 legacy aid to agencies application materials. Uh, this packet includes proposed application materials for uh, fiscal year 24 aid to agencies and a staff memo on the up and coming process. Is there any discussion on this item? Yeah, and I have a question to start out with. Um, I, I know I read it. For sure I did read it and I didn't just dream it. Um, but I'm not sure if it was a recommendation moving forward that we're not going to make any changes to legacy agencies. We'll put out the funding packet. It'll come out at the end of the year. So it'll be a couple more years yet. Is that, am I correct? Did I read that? As far as the process or the application itself? Uh, the process. I think that was our recommendation was to go through it, go through it once, see if there are flaws or things that you want to change. Because I think the last time we went through it, there were changes to the recommendations. So we didn't feel like the scoring process had truly been tested yet. Okay. The second question I have is uh, specific to the application in that this is a joint funding application. And uh, so I just want to make sure we're not blowing in the wind here because I know recommendations have been made for United Way to change it and it never gets changed. Mm -hmm. So I want to know if I'm wasting my time by making recommendations and if the city has this way, I guess, to get the changes made. To the application, we have time to make changes to the application itself. If there's things you want to add, we can definitely do that. We'll see here. So we want to open the application at the beginning of August, so sometime next week, hopefully. But we can definitely do that. So my, um, I think I just have two things on the application. I mean, generally, overall, I. I have a hate-hate relationship with this application. <laughs> I really do. So do I. <laughs> um, I think it could be a lot better, but my experience as an agency director with the United Way is recommendations from agencies just kind of went someplace. And never got. I don't care about saying that anymore because I'm not an agency director anymore. So <laughs> if they hear this, uh, yeah, it was Becky Reedus who said that. So. Um, so on page seven, uh, agency dem demographics, those should be program specific. Um, so there are some agencies that are so small that they only have one program that they're asking their money for that, in, that whole agency, so to speak, because everything they do is dedicated. An example of that might be Big Brothers, Big Sisters, could be free um, lunch program. Probably there's some other ones that I, I'm not thinking about. Um, NAMI, although NAMI does have some different programs within. And then there are other agencies that are very large and have different, and I'll, I'll cite community as one of those, as having one side of its agency dedicated to crisis intervention and the other side dedicated to food insecurity. And then there's another side of, you know, financial assistance and all that. So I'm not sure why we're asking for agency demographics. This should, the information that's presented in an application should help me as a decision maker to make the best decision possible about how to allocate funds. And if I see that the numbers are substantially increased in a program that we've been funding because of specific need. It, I, I, and I, you know, I'm just, because I'm, my mind, because I'm more familiar with community, I'm just going to, I'm going to mention that one. But, like, um, I know right now housing and food insecurity are huge issues. Cost of groceries going up. I'm interested, I'll be interested to see um, what are we looking at in terms of numbers. But another agency, um, you know, a program that we're funding may be stagnant stagnant or you know their numbers may be dropping and that's going to play a role to or a part for me in, in how I, I want to recommend money so I think that we should be asking for program specific information if we're funding 
program XYZ, let's not ask for demographics on the whole agency, let's get demographics on project XYZ. You know, that's what we should be doing. That's my number one problem. Anybody want to comment on that? I, I have a Hi. question about it. Oh, go ahead. Um, when we allocate the, the legacy aid to agency funding, are we um, restrict limiting the funds to certain programs or is it like, here you go, allocate to programs as you see? Well, it, it, but, yes and no. Okay. It, 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 agency will ask for, in fact, in, in part of this, um, their agencies are asked um, what specific program request they're okay. making, like what are you going to use the funds for. Okay. So an agency like free lunch program, that's basically all they do mm -hmm. is do the lunch. So it, it could go to operating, and that's the beauty of this funding mm -hmm. that comes from here is you can use it in operating expenses. But, and it's fine for us to get statistics or data from mm -hmm. free lunch program that's whole agency because that's more funded. Mm -hmm. But when we're funding a specific mm -hmm. program in another, I would like to see the data from sure. that specific program. Because if they've gone up or down, that's gonna make an impact to how we should be allocating our money as far as I'm concerned. So. That makes sense. So you see if you can get that change. <laughs> you, I had a question. So on the next page of the budget, there's like you select what, what level your budget is, the agency level, program specific, and then county specific. That work for you since there are different types of agencies or you want to see program specific program specific numbers I, it, it it should this application be should be specific giving us the information back that's going to help us make the best decision and if housing has become you know if if, if housing has become an increased um, need or domestic violence the numbers you know they need more money I'd rather be able to say this is why I chose to give increased, you know, money to this agency and decrease, you know, this agency. So it just has never made sense to me why why we do these agency wide demographics. Plus, so, some agencies have no ability or don't choose not to. Um, there's at least one organization that doesn't really gather that kind of stuff. Um, and so I want to make, I, I know it says unduplicated client count, but I know in some instances, I don't think that's what we're getting. I think we're getting duplicated numbers. But, um, you know, if communities asking money, if I don't know what they'll ask money for, but if they came back and asked money for food bank and they did agency wide numbers, you're going to see numbers that go up in the thousands, not because of food bank, but because of crisis intervention calls. So how can we possibly, you know, I mean, that information is absolutely useless if we don't <coughs> get it agency program specific. It just doesn't help us. So the aid to agencies often apply for operational funds? Oh, they can. So what budget would you put in there? Well, something like free lunch program would do their whole agency budget. And, and this, as she pointed out, this allows, I think it's on page, hold on, page nine, um, budget type, it says agency level program specific county specific. Right. Maybe having those at the top of the agency demographics would be good too. And an explanation that says to them, we want the numbers for the program to which you're applying. You know, that's what I want to see. I want to see numbers from them. Now, the other thing about this is, um, if you want to look at whole agency numbers, then you have to have some ability for them to provide unduplicated numbers, or um, to provide just raw data um, because not all agencies can collect the demographics that you're asking for. So that's just a comment that I um, am making on that. Um, my
from from your knowledge, do all agencies provide quality indicators? Do they complete that part now? The reporting? Well, and even in the application, both application and the quarterly reports. Um, so we review the, everyone does the quarterly reports and we review those. Like, so we do quarterly payments for the legacy agencies and then we'd review like the first quarter report before we the second quarter review. Um, I don't, quality indicators, I, I don't really know. So, but people do the well though. Okay. And I'm not the person who has administered this um, in the past either, so they may have looked at that, but I personally haven't. Um, I think the other, I'm just going to do a, um, the other area that I think is, and, and uh, the information isn't, is not gathered because it's, I don't think the agencies, maybe they don't understand how to do it or they just don't do it in a uniform manner, I guess that's the word I'm looking for, is the, is on page six of the agency, agency salaries and benefits. Personally, I think that would be helpful for us to be able to see. I'd like to know what agencies aren't paying, you know, livable salaries, <laughs> because um, I think funders should be concerned about nonprofit agencies that aren't paying, and we should be asking the questions about why they aren't paying livable salaries. And I know some of it is reimbursement rates and things like that, but. I think we should know that. If we're trying to stop homelessness, the place we could do it is through the funding process. Um, benefits also, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to see that. Um, I mean, I'd probably have some questions on, you know, when I look at fund balances and things like that um, in terms of what they're paying out to employees because not all agencies are providing benefits and I think that's a shame too because I think that just further pushes people into poverty and here we are funding trying to fund programs to stop homelessness and poverty and some of the agencies are just pushing their people further into it um, so I guess those are my my um, big ones I I'd like to see people fill out the agency salaries and benefits but um, I know one year I think I think most people filled it out wrong, and so I question whether or not we should even have it in there if they're not filling it out correctly. So it and would be helpful. Ask for more information too, or when we do the Q and A, I think that's about it. I mean, like I said, I am not a fan of this application. It's long, tedious. It was my least favorite thing to do every year. Yes. Yeah, I just want to second your attention to the kind of salaries and benefits. I think the direct service jobs in our community are some of the hardest and lowest paid. And it's not just about quality of life and for the employees, but it also impacts client care when we have so much turnover due to these not being kind of sustainable jobs to stay in. That's not good for the folks most impacted either that they're serving. So thank you. I think that um, the budget stuff we'll be able to see, like I'll be interested in reserve funds, um, what agencies are, and, and if they have plans for those kinds of things. But those are questions I'll probably ask, um, you know, either after I review applications or at the presentation, so. That's, that's all I have. So when the applications are turned in, if an agency doesn't receive, uh, if the agency is only asking for money from the city, do, do those applications come directly to you then? So if it's not United Way, Coralville, Johnson County, and Iowa City? They, they all go into this and we can take out the ones that okay. apply to Okay. So how, how exactly would we like to uh, kind of word or consolidate our recommendation? Well, uh, I don't, I'm not gonna go so as far as to tell staff what to do, but I'm just, ask if 
I think you understood what I, so you'll have, you'll figure it out. I mean, I imagine you'll have to consult with United Way staff. Like I said, I'll be watching um, <laughs> to see if anything gets done. I have my doubts. Is there, I had a question, is there something specific um, to change with the, the salary section? So I, I understood your point, but I didn't understand what specifically uh, in the application needed well, to be added. Let, let me back up and tell you how some agencies use this information. Um, they, uh, they will use this uh, locally, some agencies, to determine salary levels, like the review um, salary levels. Uh, yeah, I mean, we used to do that <coughs> once a year to determine if we are mar you know, still in the market and com you know, competitive. Um, boards. Uh, will use this information to determine start, starting salaries or um, if, they've, if they've got, uh, if they're hiring a new uh, executive director or CEO. This is one of the areas. And when you don't get all the information from the agencies, like um, to know what each agency is paying, and maybe some of those agencies feel that they shouldn't have to give that information, that's fine. but it really skews it, um, you know, if you're not getting complete information. So, you know, I just, whatever way in which you get everybody to complete it the same way, but it's not. Sometimes people just put hash marks that they have those benefits, but I believe that, that it requires you to actually put the salary amount. It has to be a little. Uh, well, I. Well, I was going to say it has to be a little fluid because not every agency has the same positions. So, but I think my recollection of the application is that they'll have some examples and so you just kind of fit in as, as best as you can. So, go ahead. I think um, listing all of, listing the actual salaries, um, I think I might have a problem with that. I would m much rather say that there's a salary range. Because if you have, if you have a, for instance, a, an executive director that's been there for a long time, their salary may be higher than another executive director that was newly hired at an agency that does totally different things, if that makes sense. I mean, it does, but a lot of agencies don't have ranges for those top positions. Um, so, and they're set. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would never have put my salary on on that application. It, it's actually. Mm -hmm. It's. It's. See, okay, and that's a good example. We did. She didn't. So, what good does it do? Um, actually, it's on the 990. You can find out. Oh, I know. I understand that. Salary on the 990. Right. And to tell you the truth, uh, you know, if you look at job. Um, uh, postings and stuff like that. Best practices now are to put the um, salary range on it. So, right, so, there's a salary range. So if you're saying make it uniform, that's fine with me, make it uniform. I'm suggesting you make some changes so that it is, so that it's useful, because it's not useful as it is right, right. now. I think it's helpful for um, if there's direct care staff, if there are, you know, uh, a lot of different positions, then that would make sense to say, you know, direct care staff are hired in at $15 an hour or whatever with no benefits, something like that, if that's the case, mm -hmm. you know. I think some but. agencies do averages. That's, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. it, however they look at it, it's helpful, but United Way has been getting these for a long time. I, I think this joint funding process was started shortly before I came in 2008. And um, it has never um, been applied consistent, no. consistently. And just get it consistent so it's useful or stop getting it, one or the other. I mean, it's not helpful to have it. And it just, it takes agencies time to, to complete that information. But a lot of that's because that's the United Way funding. That's not necessarily this funding, is it? Well, that's why I asked in the beginning was I just, you know, am I wasting my time saying these are problems in the application? Um, 
you know, because this, there's only one question in here that's Iowa City specific. The rest of it, I think, is every question is for all the mm -hmm. entities yeah. that fund. So, yeah, you just let me know if you get any changes made. I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> I guess I'm wondering, are you looking for, like, added instructions on here or specifically, like, if you could change anything on this form, what would it be? Or you're just encouraging the agencies? Make added that instructions, out? something that helps agencies figure out how they want to, or make all of them go to, I know they do a pre-funding type um, class, make everybody go to that or something, so. But if, if, if it's not, there's some misunderstanding someplace because there's a variety of ways in which agencies fund that, so. And you know, if too many agencies say we don't wanna give those salaries out, then stop asking for it, so. Because um, some agencies follow it to the T, others don't. It's just not helpful. Uh, I just don't understand how is the salary cap can affect uh, the application and how much is, is a good salary that we can consider it on, on the application. Well, in terms of salaries, what yeah. the salaries yes. are? Um, well, I don't know, I, I don't, but I don't have any control over that. Um, mm -hmm. All I'm saying is they're asking the question and they should get consistent. Everybody should be filling it out the same way. If I had my way, I'd take out a number of these questions in this application, yes. but I, 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 that's not gonna happen. So you're asking the wrong person. You'd have to <laughs> ask United Way, I guess. <laughs> Master, can you say your question again? Yeah, because if, if they put the salary on the application uh, and I look at the salary, this will affect their, their grade or their scoring negatively or positively. Hmm. Can I get them more money to, to pay their, their staff very well or get less money because they are not paying enough salary to, to their staff? Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. yeah. I might look at their fund balance if they have an excess. Um, best practice is 50% of your annual budget. There's some contingency factors with that for fund balance. If they had excess fund balance and they were paying their staff low salary, it's then, yeah, I'd ask the question. Or equity, like the disparity between the higher, you know, the leadership staff versus the direct right. service staff. Yeah. Um, if it were an agency that weren't reliant on reimbursement dollars to pay for staff, like, um, you know, with Medicaid reimbursement and stuff, I would ask the question about why they're not paying, you know, their staff more because, again, it goes back to that old, what I said before is, you know, I don't want to encourage poverty level salaries and I don't want to be funding and encouraging the growth of those kinds right. of organizations when, you know, we're trying to, that's what we're trying to fight. You know? It is sort of a conundrum though because there's so many agencies that apply and their funding sources are so different in a lot of those agencies. So, I mean, it's, it's certainly not an easy process, I don't think, to go if you had to look at all of these agencies to try and make it so it's consistent through every agency. I mean, it's just the funding sources are all over the map. I mean, there's, you know, there's a hierarchy of, uh, of who, who donors want to give money to. You know, it's like on your income tax, you get an automatic deduction if you're blind, but not if you're deaf. You're right, there is a hierarchy, but I mean, but there's also um, some agencies can overcome some of that by uh, doing active fundraising. Um, so, you know. Some can. Some can, some, some can, can't. some don't try. Um, well, so, yeah. Um, but it, it, I don't, if it, you take it out, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I guess that's what I'm saying, but mm -hmm. it's useless um, yeah. the way it's in here right yes. now. It's absolutely, and why make the agencies do this um, if, if it's not useful? It just doesn't do us any good. 
And I think Becky's right. I mean, you can make that recommendation to the United Way because it's the, actually the joint. The application is for the joint thing, but it's basically the United Way application. And if it, you can make recommendations, and we can see what happens. Would it be useful if we had, rather than this chart, like a narrative question, like answering those specific questions that you guys have? Are you paying your staff? A living? Like, would that be better? And then, yeah. um, you know, what's the disparity mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. higher level? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what kind of cost of living increases? Are you right. living? What is your what concerns do you have about your staffing level? You know, what's your turnover? You know, I mean, and what's I your think, rationale? I think there could be some narrative questions that would be a lot better. Yeah, that would help even going farther up the ladder than just this group, mm -hmm. but but the need in our community to fund this pot of agency fund, you know, money that we are able to allocate. Are we? Are, do we have enough, or do we need more? You know, that that would be a great way to to um, get that information. So, I like that. Mm -hmm. I just infuse more meaning. I would leave the ins health insurance, what the total premium is, relative to the contribution of the agency p for both individual and family. Yeah, you could, you know, a ask if they're offering insurance. And, and the follow-up question might be, what are the barriers to doing that? Um, yeah. Uh, and, and then if they're offering it, what is, you know, uh, you know, what is their plan like in terms of agency or employee contribution, um, premium contribution, and then, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know if we have to look at the type of plan that they get, because I do believe also low-paying jobs get crappy high paying, co paying insurance and that again pushes people further into poverty. But but you could, you know, maybe around insurance retirement's another one. Um, I I will say that I was always really impressed with Iowa City that the nonprofits here really pushed the retirement. And I do believe United Way some years ago had something to do with that. Um, you know, I think they met with boards or encourage boards to develop retirement plans for agency um, and and I like that so they get kudos for that one um, so but I'd like to know are all agencies participating in you know because anybody could do a SEP IRA um, they don't have to do 401k so um, and then you know maybe talking about uh, the direct care position because that's the position I think we're always concerned about um, and you know what's the, what's their what's their salary range um, what's their are they experiencing significant turnover in that area mm -hmm. uh, I can't think of what other questions off the top of my head might, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. yeah I think I think that would be great I think that would tell us a lot about capacity too. Like, if there is high turnover and if they're paid below fifteen dollars an hour, I promise you that's showing up in how the clients are feeling. And I mean, some of the agencies are looking at numbers like hourly rates at Walmart. Um, I mean, I don't blame people to leave a thirteen-hour dollar an hour job to go pick up 1350 that's thousand bucks more in their pocket every year so um, but we also watched other agencies you know very closely to see what what they were paying um, and we tried to match if not you know go above it a little bit so yep I I think those would be some really good information for us not only us to be able to see that but for us to be able to pass on to um, city Council when we um, start to push to increase that mm -hmm. that pot of funds like for example winter shelter couldn't open it opened a month later than intended because they couldn't hire people that was I think more due to the staffing shortages COVID and the great resignations. Well, right, but if it paid $25 an hour yes, to manage right. yep. 50 people with externalizing behaviors in a small space, which is very hard to do. I used to, 
um, I used to get uh, corridor careers every week, not because I was looking for a job, but because I was keeping an eye on the job openings at, of nonprofits. And there's one nonprofit that was advertising for a position for six months. And I know it was because their salary was so low. Um, and those are problems I think that, that you know, we should know about and you know, I would, I'd like to be able to address, start to address some of that. Uh, so would we like to uh, carry on with the plan as they've listed or add uh, precautions for conformity and more of a narrative questionnaire about compensation and treatment of their staff? Yeah, you want me to try and put a motion together? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That, um, so are we, are, we're just looking for recommendations. What's the actual, where we make a decision on this or review and consider approval? So what do you need from us tonight? Just a recommendation to approve the application or if there's adjustments you want us to make. Okay. That. So I'm going to, I'm going to um, move that we approve the application um, with the recommended changes to um, the agency demographics that they're program specific pertinent to the request of the organization as one the second is that the salary information um, has been revised and benefits salary benefits and retirement yes Can I have a second? I second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. And item number eight is a discussion of the Iowa City Housing Authority annual plan for fiscal year 22. Would staff like to introduce the plan? Sure, so um, this plan, it's more of a report. It's sort of like a report out of last year. Um, from the Iowa City Housing Authority. So I'm just gonna highlight a few things um, that I think are interesting in the report. Uh, so Iowa, the Iowa City Housing Authority serves Johnson County, Iowa County, and Washington County north of Highway 92. We have, um, we have about 1,500 um, vouchers or units that we provide. Um, a majority of that is a, the standard housing choice voucher. We also have 95 veteran VASH vouchers, which serve veterans. Um, a couple years back, we got mainstream vouchers. We have 78 of those. They serve non-elderly persons with a disabling condition currently experiencing homelessness. Um, last year, we got emergency housing vouchers. Um, we have 69 of those. We partner with Shelter House, and they um, select those, make referrals through coordinated entry. Um, Project-based vouchers, this report um, reflects Cross Park Place where we have 24 um, vouchers for the, the residents um, in Cross Park Place. We've also added 36 um, project-based vouchers for the 501 project, next, that's our second housing first project at Shelter House. Um, that's not in this report because that just happened this year. Um, we have 86 scattered site public housing units and then we have um, 16 city-owned affordable housing units that we operate similar to public housing, but they're not federally funded. And um, 10 are out at Peninsula, and six are at Augusta Place, which is on Iowa Avenue, just behind the city hall. We have 58% of the clients we serve are disabled or elderly head of households. Um, I wanted to highlight our family self-sufficiency program. It's a kind of a benefit of being on our program is that you can set up an escrow savings account and as your income increases, money gets put into that account income. And then you can withdraw the funds um, for things that, so you set goals that you want to become self-sufficient and then you can withdraw those funds to reach your goals. So for example, if your goal is to finish your degree, but you need a laptop, <coughs> withdraw your escrow funds for that purpose. Or another common one is um, someone's goal might be to maintain employment, but their car broke down. So they can withdraw funds, car repairs are very expensive, they could withdraw $1,000 to repair their, get new tires or something like that. 
Um, so the average escrow savings account balance is $6,370. Um, I saw one recently that was like $55,000, which was really impressive. Um, so that is one part of our program. We also have a home ownership program. So people who have a voucher um, and meet certain criteria are, and are in a position they could convert their voucher to home ownership. Um, we've done 48 of those since 2003. Um, our housing assistance payments, which are the monthly rent payments that go to landlords, um, we're expecting that to be about 8.3 million to, for the calendar year 2022. Our total housing choice voucher program is 9 point, almost 9.7 million for the year. No, it's a it's a good report. Yeah. So this will go. We'll have counsel for this. May I have a motion to recommend approval of the Iowa City Housing Authority annual plan? So moved. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I didn't do any of my first. <laughs> and for agenda item number nine, uh, consider recommendation to city council on approval of HCDC bylaws amendment. Uh, staff has drafted a proposed amendment to uh, the HC HCDC bylaws uh, based on the discussion at the June meeting. Is there any discussion on that draft? I have just one quick comment. I talked to Carol earlier. She was not able to attend tonight, but um, she called to talk to a couple of things and heard a comment on this with the she felt it should be nonprofit management and that she was going to be have a motion to recommend that council approve the amendment to the HCDC bylaws with the inclusion of the nonprofit management experience. I'm sorry, what did you say? I was just reading a couple of you were asking that question. Do, do you have any more comments on the bylaws or would you like to follow through with the motion? Um, I do. Um, because in the agenda it says additionally the amendment would encourage diversity and in, in, in appointments. Is that just a statement, or did we make some? I had it worded differently originally, but um, I talked to the city attorney's office, and all the boards and commissions use the same application, so we don't really have a ton of flexibility. Like if we were going to say something specific, like last time we talked about um, adding familial status, we don't ask a question really on the application that is about that, so it would be hard to word it specifically like that. So the suggestion was to take the language, the last sentence there is from the Human Rights Commission. So okay. That's where that came from. So I just, I needed some clarification on that. Um, okay, uh, I'm, I move, let's see, what do I move? Uh, I move that we, uh, are we asking, are we actually approving the bylaws to send to the city. City Council is approving them. Yeah, you're recommending the council. Uh, okay, so I I move that we recommend the City Council approve the HCDC bylaws um, with the expanded membership requirements to include one member with nonprofit management experience and one member with property management experience. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item number 10 is staff and commission updates. The staff have any updates? So a few quick ones. Um, for next meeting, we were not planning to meet in August, so that was in September 15th, so that will be a great point in emails. <laughs> um, and then we have a 
by that time we should have the legacy submission. So this process is going to start up for early August and then we'll be able to get you those submissions when they're available. How long will we have to review? Span at least a couple of months. Yeah, we'll Good. do a okay. QA and go through all those steps, so we should have plenty of time to work through it before we're okay. actually scoring. Uh, the September meeting, we'll look at the caper. That's the report that talks about everything we did for the last fiscal year. We have another vacancy on HGDC, so our new commission member resigned because he got a job at City Hall, so you can find him at the front desk. Oh. <laughs> Who's our new commission member? What was that? We had an, somebody that, had, who was it? Uh, Zachary Slocum. Oh, he, he was just appointed and then he resigned. Yep, yep. So if you know anyone who's interested, um, there will be the vacancy posted soon. At the last meeting, we also talked about travel reimbursements for boarding commissions. So I dug into that the best I could. What I learned was that in the past, we've reimbursed for things like events or trainings that are directly related to the commission. Um, it sounds like at one point the <coughs> Truth and Reconciliation Commission did a recommendation in council um, to do more reimbursements for things like child care, but it doesn't sound like council took any action on that. So they also recommended uh, uh, compensation for attending meetings and such. Right. So basically, we could put that on a future agenda if you want to talk about it. You could do a similar thing where you make a recommendation to council if you decide to do that. <coughs> I know where the free parking is now. <laughs> the free parking is now. So. <laughs> Those are all I am not a babysitter. <laughs> are there any updates from commissioners? If you have an August meeting, I won't be here, so I'm on. Do you call it vacation when you're retired? I'll be on what you all call vacation. <laughs> um, item number 11 is an adjournment. I uh, may I have a motion to adjourn. So motioned. Is that what I'm <laughs> all in favor say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? <laughs> Good job. Good job. Oh, thank you. 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 Thank